Hi, David Toulis. Our show covers local economy and the free market. You've heard the news by now, I suppose, of the Hamilton County Commission overturning its earlier vote to have automated speed cameras, two of them, which were to have been purchased by Sheriff Jim Hammond to uh, patrol, if you will, uh, certain narrow places where police cars could not, or sheriff, sheriff's deputies' cars could not readily hide in waiting to uh, control the speed of, pass, of uh, pass, passing vehicles. This vote was overturned after uh, a huge outcry, which I think uh, struck everyone involved in this in this sort of routine process with uh, alarm and a sense of uh, a sense of unease. And, and and the outcry that the county commissioners heard was, I would like to suggest, pent up from other other parts of the of, uh, of of the world, other parts of human experience, which is building up with a little bit of uh, steam, if you will, a little bit of pressure in the backs of people's minds. When and and they're, the people are are unhappy with government in general. They're unhappy with the magistrate, the judges, the police, their representatives, and their uh, all the faces that that are government. All the uh, the faces that are the um, kind of the, the humanization factor, the, the marketing factor, if you will, of the state. Uh, the deep state behind that, and then the state and government kind of in the foreground behind the faces that make up those whom we elect and their, uh, and their underlings who are hired to be on the, the taxpayer payroll. There's frustration with government in general. And so the, the backlash against last week's vote I think is is uh, significant because it shows that people want an, they want a way out. They want to see uh, something, at least one tiny, tiny thing stopped. These are laser cameras, laser uh, radar, if you will, that are very accurate and are robotized, sending a fifty dollar uh, administrative assessment, if you will, to the offending vehicle's owner based on the the tag, a photograph of the tag on the back that that uh, uh, identifies the, the car's owner, since the car is a, a piece of state property held nominally by the, the user. Uh, I, I mention that because uh, my son, my son uh, the 17-year-old, yesterday traded a motorbike, and the, the man from whom he traded the motorbike extended two documents to him. One was a bill of sale giving names and so on, the amount of money that uh, is the estimated value of the two dirt bikes, and then a green rectangle, large uh, certificate. Now, the, the rectangle is called a certificate of title, and <laughs> the man didn't have the actual title. No, he, he couldn't have that, but he trades in a certificate of title, meaning the title is o the, the, the thing that shows ownership. That is held elsewhere. Well, where? We don't know. <laughs> but somewhere, maybe in Nashville, maybe in a database, somewhere is the the ownership document that is, and who's holding this document? Who has possessory claim on it? Who has the first claim on this asset, these, uh, this uh, motorcycle, a little bit of dirt and the under fender and uh, rubbery tires that are allegedly street legal? Well, the state owns that bike and my son just traffics in the nominal ownership of it, having obtained the title, up oh, the certificate of title, which he will then present to the county clerk to be assessed the tax of the vehicle that belongs uh, to the state of Tennessee. So people, when they go through things like that, they just say, well, that's just how government is. And, and we realize that we, the people, have been sort of alienated from ownership of things. We've been alienated from our, our rights. We've been alienated from local economy. And uh, there, are, uh, there are interpositions at every turn. And so we're frustrated and we're angry. And the, the backlash of the county commission's vote reflects uh, a, a frustration among people who uh, have nowhere else to lash out. They know that writing a, a, sending an email to Representative Chuck Fleischman about the NSA, that, that there's no purpose in that. Right? They realize that the situation has degraded so far that there's no point in voting. There's no point in complaining to the federal representative. Well, last night I, I attend, as I do every Tuesday, the uh, the weekly gathering of Trail Life USA. This is a group of of uh, men 
and they have formed a re the replacement group for the Boy Scouts who who put the 357 homosexual magnum in their mouths and pulled the trigger, blew their brains out of the back of their heads. Well, not quite. They, it just caused confusion. The, the, the blowback was just confusing to the Boy Scouts, and they're going to be smoking toward the ground for the next 25 years, perhaps, until finally uh, they are uh, deceased. That, that organization, it is deceased. Or unless there's a reformation of some kind, a repentance, perhaps. But Trail Life USA is a, is a new organization that's taking its place. The marketplace is answering brand suicide. And, uh, I, I, but there are many things that are very much in favor of Trail Life USA. Number one is that there is a respect for uh, the created order that God has made. And there is no compromise on the question of, of, uh, uh, of uh, these passions that homosexuals have. We're not going to allow these passions in. We're not going to allow people in the organization who express them openly or, uh, or, or, or market them or sell them or peddle them. We're not going to, we're not going to encourage uh, the sexualization of boys, right? Y young boys, uh, they're not going to be sexualized by people in the organization nor the organization itself. It will not stand on anything that pretends to favor uh, sodomy, which by the way, uh, sodomy is uh, being legalized in the military in the recent appropriations bill, according to a story I, I looked at last night, it's been, uh, yeah, cnsnews.com has, has an account of the, the legalization of sodomy. So, uh, you know, the Boy Scouts are pro-sodomy and uh, it's, not, it, it's legal, right? It's, it was made legal in 2003 by, the, by the, the good people in the federal court in Washington, the, the highest court of appeal in uh, Lawrence versus Texas. And, uh, and so, well, he, here's what happened. Every time, he, I, I, let me just admit a fault to you, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm a, a partial man. I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, absent of, of many faults. And one of them is that I, I hesitate at the Pledge of Allegiance. And, every, and, and the, the Trail Life USA organization has not retreated from the Bellamy script, the script modified in the 1950s to insert the word uh, under God, of course, Francis Bellamy devised the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, I, 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 I've, I've just given up trying to do that. I, but I don't want to, I don't want to scorn this, uh, this pious event, this pious sort of national oriented, nation state oriented uh, event that occurs in public meetings and city council meetings, for example. And I would just assume not be everyone noticing, if, if anyone notices me at all, uh, to say, well, there's a man who's he, he, he's got his hand, one, his right hand is on his briefcase handle, or oh, he, he's fiddling with a camera. Why is he fiddling with his camera when we're supposed to be saying the pledge? Because that's what I do, right? That's why I, I, I fiddle with my camera. I, I duck out to go to the men's room. Well, yesterday my, my ruse was to, oh, I, I just arrived, and they're just about to do the flag part of the ceremony. They come in with the flag, the, the federal flag, right, with the 50 pentacles on it. The, you know, the pentacle is a, it has an occultic pentagrammical origin, which you might want to look into sometime. But, but anyway, that flag with the, the bars and the, and the stars, I, I, you know, I, all right, I, here, they're, here they're coming. Right, the next is going to be the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to have to stand there and put my hand on my, my heart and pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, okay. Already, I've got four problems right there in those in that in that half a sentence. I've got four problems that are historical, political, legal problems with this statement, uh, e even theological problems. Under God, indivisible. <laughs> there you go. There's number five, uh, with liberty and justice for all. Well, that that last part's fine, but there are reasons to not say the pledge, and and I, I wish. I wish that uh, the, the good men, who, uh, Christian men who founded this organization would be a little bit more suspicious, a little bit more wary of our loss of local economy. And we've lost local economy in the nation state. And, and Francis Bellamy and his, his cousin, Edward, I, you need to know about Edward Bellamy. He was a socialist who wrote a, a dream book, like, a little bit like Thomas More's Utopia back in the 1600s. The dream book was, or is called, Looking Backward. It's a, a novel about 
a man who falls asleep in Boston, and he wakes up in the year 2000 to find a, a socialist utopia where everyone is t cared for, everyone has the same wages, everybody maybe looks alike. I have not read the book, but it's probably online at, at Scribe D or a place like that. But uh, the two Bellamy's, these relations, uh, were, uh, were, were, were men of note. They wanted uh, the idea of one, well, they, they wanted one nation, and the idea of one nation, if you, if you look that up in a, in a dictionary, according to uh, a nice little uh, piece by uh, David Jones as a, a Tennessee pastor and a headmaster in a, in a private school in Tennessee, uh, Middle Tennessee. Uh, the idea of one nation is, uh, is one in which there are not distinctions of, of wealth. There are no distinctions politically or socially. And uh, the concept, according to uh, Pastor Jones, uh, between, let's see, yeah, the concept and the relationship between Edward and Francis is illuminated further by noting the 19th century use of the term one nation. The Oxford English Dictionary uses, explains the usage, usages of the word nation. In a separate entry, two nations is defined as two groups within any, a given nation divided from each other by marked social inequality. Hence, one nation, a nation which is not divided by social inequalities. And, of course, if you believe in local economy, if you believe in the free market, you realize there has to be a difference in result. There always has to be a difference in result. There are, there's difference in genius. Look at you. Look how smart you are, my listener, compared to other men. You know that you're superior to them in reading, in talent, in insight. Maybe sometimes you've thought, maybe even in wisdom, because other men seem to be careless about things that you know are important. Well, notice there, that's, in, that's inequality right there, that you are a thrifty, prudent man. You care about capital. You are stewarding your assets. You love your wife. You have children. You participate in the great things of the American, American dream. And, and others don't. Well, that, that means already that because you are you and other men are other men, that proves right there that we can't have one nation. Well, that's one, of the, you know, that, that's one problem with this pledge. And why, why a pledge? A pledge is a, a kind of a, 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 an oath, taking, making a promise, maybe like signing a contract. You pledge to love your wife, but when you pledge allegiance to the flag, what, what, is, what are you getting back? What is the exchange? Oh, okay, oh, okay. security. Oh, yeah, okay, you get, you get security. Oh, I understand now. <laughs> And, you know, and, and allegiance. Well, allegiance, again, is something that, that is, the idea is fidelity, faithfulness, love, uh, self-denial in the service of this entity, the nation, the nation state. So, um, I, and, and the idea that things can't be divided, that's also a problem. Look in your house. Look how things are divided in your house, right? You've got your family name on the doorpost, if you will, and things are divided. Look, you have authority. Your wife has certain responsibilities. You do too. Your elder son, he does the dishes in the garbage. The middle son does, uh, he, he clears the dishwasher, runs the vacuum cleaner Saturday night in the kitchen, in the hallway. The girl, well, she has, uh, she, she does part of the bathrooms. The boys do the other part. See, it's all divided. Division is important. Division allows for local economy. Local economy is, again, that's, that's you making a living. That's you prospering. And that is the theme of our show. That is what I like to talk about and to ask questions about. My name is David Toulis, and again, our show is Nuganomics.com. We are here at Copperhead 1240, the little station that could, not owned by a corporate giant, owned by individuals, small players, common, common, common people. And we are the NASCAR station. We've got a great lineup uh, ahead uh, as we uh, upgrade our programming, become a little bit more serious about what we're about, trying to serve the public. We, are, uh, we have a federal license uh, for this little chunk of the, the airwaves, and we, we have a great stewardship. We, are, uh, we, we make it inexpensive to get on the air. We provide a great service, and our service will increase not just with Nuganomics.com and Generation Z, but we hope to have a Laura Ingram on board and uh, George Norrie, Coast to Coast at midnight. Your teen son needs to know about Coast to Coast, and he will wreck his sleep cycle by <laughs> knowing that that's, that is on here at Copperhead 1240. 
And we've got another a comedian, uh, a, a former liberal, and I can't think of his name offhand, but uh, he's going to be on, I think, in the morning. And we, we're here to serve you. So that's our purpose here at, uh, at Nuganomics.com. Well, think about, just think about division. Didn't Moses divide the tribes in the Old Testament? The idea that things can't be divided, that things have to be unitary, are, are simply wrong, wrong-headed. Why, why was uh, the Hebrew Republic, the Old Republic, divided into 12 tribes? Not, not they weren't states, of course, they were tribes. There were 12 kingdoms within a kingdom. It, the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew Republic was a confederacy, a confederacy of tribes from the great sons of, of Isaac, such as Joseph and, and, uh, and Judah and, and, and 10 others. And the whole idea of breaking, ending uh, a system of divisions is also a problem. Think about, do you remember in, from your Sunday school days, remember, I, I know you're not a, a church-going Christian, but you, you have been in Sunday school, and I know you've heard about the account, or heard the account of, of uh, the Israelites wanting to be uh, people subject to a king as those in the nations around them. Well, the nations around them had unitary kingdoms. They were not, of course, states at the time, but they were, they were kingdoms. They were fiefdoms. They were absolutist despotisms, usually, in the Orient. And, uh, and th but they had the advantage of having divisions. That's why, they, that's why Israelites are so incredibly literary. That's why modern Jews who claim descendancy from the, old, from the, from the children of Israel are, so, uh, are also so articulate, wh whether in law or music or or the arts. But Samuel warned the Israelites against wanting a king. And he, he had, has a great speech to them, uh, to the representatives who clamored for one. And he said, well, the king will take your, he will take your children, he will confiscate your lands, he will bring your sons into his, uh, into his entourage, uh, he will make them courtiers in his, in his court. And uh, there, there won't be the old harmony. And sure enough, when, when once there was a kingdom within uh, two, two reigns, or within three reigns, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon, there was enough animosity to break up the old relationships, and there were wars. Unitary government uh, brought war. Of course, unitary government made Israel, the republic, uh, a great trading power for a time, and uh, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of gold and silver that flowed into, into that, uh, into that, that uh, part of the world is part of God's blessing. But, but the idea of the pledge is something that bothers me. And so I, I, always, find, I, I always find that when the Pledge of Allegiance is made in a public meeting that, that I, I've, got, I've got to check my tape in my cassette player. Oh, I, I, you know, I've got to make sure I've got the right pen. So I, I have my briefcast out and I'm f fussing around in there. Or, oh, you know, I, I, I've, I've got to wash my hands in the men's room. So this is, this is me, David Toolish, your host, a faulty man, okay? I know... I'm a faulty man, and I know this is part of my fault, but you're just going to have to forgive me. Uh, but, that, but I want you to know that, that, that I, am, uh, I am truly uh, a hopeful man. And I'm hopeful for local economy. And, and I'm hopeful because I realize, and, and I want you to understand, that there can't be reform out from outside of our country. It cannot happen. There's no, there's no rescue. Uh, from afar. There's no, there's no help coming from faraway places, from, you might say, from the deep state, if you, if you want to talk about that sometime. There's no help coming from there. Uh, you know, the Constitution is, for all practical purposes, just, it's just irrelevant. It's irrelevant, and it means anything that a federal judge wants it to mean. And the, the national power is unaccountable to the people. There's no mechanism to check it. The ballot box compromised, you know, digital, yeah, digital uh, balloting, right? Okay, and and even if they, even if the records were actu accurately kept of the vote, what would it matter? What would it? Who? How would a federal election matter at all? It, it, would it matter at all? Well, I think we need to realize that for the sake of Chattanooga, and Hamilton County, and for our own sanity, we need to realize that there's not going to be help from these places. And look at how uh, we don't have real choices politically. Look at how third parties are oppressed. They cannot get a hearing. And they can't get a hearing in the Times Free Press. The Times Free Press will studiously ignore 
the, you know, the fourth branch of government, the official, the official media will studiously ignore the ideas of a minority candidate, of a third party candidate. And you know, people are afraid of losing their tenuous hold on prosperity and their personal peace by rocking the boat. So people are compliant, right? People have become very compliant. Just look at, the, look at some of the stories that have moved in the past couple of days about, uh, about, uh, about the police state. I hope, I hope to mention three of them that just popped into my notice today. Uh, look at the Patriot Act and the Department of Homeland Security uh, undermining the Bill of Rights. That they're supposed to protect you here in Chattanooga. You don't have that protection. But that law, you know, 10 or 11 years old, 12 years old now, provides the blueprint for the police state. And it's not that we have a blue state coming. It's not that it's ahead. Don't worry about it coming, okay, guys? <laughs> Don't think that there's a danger of it. It's already here. <laughs> and what about all those deficits? What about uh, the endless spending? Uh, and, and, and think about the left. The left took the offensive at least 50 years ago and has held it and has held momentum ever since. And then there's the great problem of scale. The scale problem, which is why I believe local economy is a, a kind of formula for local salvation. Now salvation, of course, is something that God offers, but there, there are, there are uh, mimicking kinds of salvation that are, that are small and local, right? There are, you can't have a salvation, you can have redemption of something like you can redeem a debt, okay? So redemption and salvation are not necessarily things that belong only to God, though he does, he is the template for the whole idea of redemption. But uh, the problem of scale is, is, a, is, is a grave problem. There are 435 uh, representatives in the federal Congress. That means there's one representative, according to uh, a great little video that I saw this morning from the Abbeville Institute in South Carolina. There's one representative for every 759,000 people. That's not Republican government. That's not Republican. <laughs> uh, James Madison uh, said that he, he imagined a limit of a one rep per 30,000 people, which means if, that, uh, if you extend that figure out, there would be 10,500 representative, representatives in the federal House. Clearly, that's, uh, the House would be dysfunctional that way. So, that, so what we don't ha what, we, what we have is we don't have a we have a kind of state from Hobbes right the the the, the, the genius behind the, the total state we don't have republican government we don't have constitutional government and uh, John Calhoun the South Carolina senator back in the heyday of the republic said stripped of all this covering the naked question is whether ours is a federal or consolidated government a constitutional or absolute one, a government resting solidly on the basis of the sovereignty of the states or on the unrestrained will of a majority, a form of government, as in all other unlimited ones in which injustice, violence, and force must ultimately prevail. Well, they have. They have prevailed, and there is not, there is not an out for us through the national system. We don't have the scale problem uh, makes reform impossible. So that means that you, my listener, have got to think about what you can do to prosper yourself, to obtain liberty, and to live a ferocious and free life. You need to take some chances. You need to take a risk. You need to realize that to be a free man, you have to know your rights. And then you have to be a, del a belligerent claimant in person, belligerent claimant in person. Well, we're going to talk some more about these things. Hang on. Coverage continues Sunday here at live on the Motor Racing Network, the voice of NASCAR. And for ticket information, go to MRN.com. Check it out this Sunday live on Chattanooga's official NASCAR radio station. Copperhead 1240. Get 0% financing and a $1,000 rebate on a 2014 Camry. This is unheard of. 0% financing and a $1,000 rebate on a new 2014 Camry. You have to get the Capital Toyota on Lee Highway. Get 0% financing and a $1,000 rebate on a 2014 Camry. 0% financing and a $1,000 rebate. Capital Toyota on Lee Highway with a savings are that much better. 
When you look with the eyes, we need the sound saying his past, going to another place. She left us here. Death is so much more than a trying time, but we have to deal with it. You want a funeral home that helps you get through your ordeals. You want a professional, but not one who lacks warmth or sincerity. I'm Josh Jennings. That's what I offer at Hamilton Funeral Home and Cremation Services at Gibson. Care for you. A local owner and operator who keeps your funeral costs down. A great place to be strong. Even so, it's a lot and a lot more. Just call me. 531-3975. This is Josh. Again, the number is 531-3975. Hamilton Field Park. Oh, one more thing. Love your neighbor. Buy a little. He's a better outside your home or business than him. He's a better quality. Okay, so, um, for indoor areas, farm indoor professionals that are known as duck busters, please take the assistance using 127 definable duck busters steps. Let Mark Thompson address the indoor air quality that your business to help reduce employee limits. For that fire, by cleaning your dryer bins. Mark and his parents, Dick and Joan Thompson, have been building a local economy and helping local people with HVAC systems 16 years. Ducks, indoor professionals. Call 876 9907. 876 9907. Ducks, call now. Hi, my name is Bruce Craig with the Entrepreneur Source. I help people who want to be self employed. I help my clients through a very fact based and analytical process to understand all the criteria that's important to them. I then help them look at franchises or businesses that fit their criteria. Once my clients find the right opportunity, I help them find the best way to finance the business, including paying themselves to the startup phase. If you're just curious to understand the types of businesses that may be right for you, please call me for a free assessment. My phone number is 423-875-5621. With recent changes out of Washington, turn to each of the tax tax service for help. Professional advice, confidential service, fair prices, someone to trust all your law. Call 332 These are tax professionals and they're waiting to serve you. Or visit us at 1032 Days of Pike in Saudi Daisy, across from the Fire Hall. Another office is on Brainerd Road. We guarantee our work. Call 332 Online at ejpelton.com. Think ahead. Get the latest news and information now. On your Twitter account, search Hot News Radio. That's Hot News Radio. For the latest news and information, go to Hot News Radio. That's Twitter.com. Then search Hot News Radio. Hot News Radio is a service of Copperhead 1240. Live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, it's New Comics with David... Hi, David Toulis. I want to tell you a little bit about a story in the Wall Street Journal <laughs> about Monsanto. Monsanto has developed a, a software system called Field Scripts, which lets farmers analyze minutely uh, their fields, their, sh their the shade in their fields, the light on their fields, submit the data to the cloud where Monsanto stewards uh, uh, software and servers to to analyze the data and then tell tell the farmer exactly what to do so he's out there in the field and he's got a high-tech tractor and loads of uh, fertilizer back on the end of the row and he can he can do exactly what the cloud tells him to do and uh, the, the, the problem that the story points out is that that it's it's not almost not worth it, it, it te technology is so high high ended so exasperatingly perfect that it, it doesn't really help the farmer. It's very expensive and when the, when the weather is good it uh, adds marginal value to income. When the weather is bad it might help some. But the problem that, that, it, that the story points out is that it, it's a further centralization of the food world. It's called the, f the, the farming industry, right? <laughs> I've always I've always smiled when I hear hear that term the farming industry. Well, I want to talk about that, but also the the uh, Casey bankruptcy filing in Chattanooga uh, that that touches on uh, the the work of a businessman who owns the supposedly notorious sinking restaurant barge opposite the aquarium on the Tennessee River. I, I personally uh, 
I personally don't dislike anything that's ugly. And even though I, I am a man of artistic temperament, I do have a, a, a sense of aesthetic development, being a, a writer and a, a, a fairly decent consumer of, of literature. And uh, with artists in my family, a brother who's an artist in Atlanta, Thomas Tulis is, is one, and a, a daughter in Manhattan, uh, a young sculptor, she's, she's 21. And so I, I have uh, a lot of familiarity with art. And on the other hand, I also like the idea of the free market. And the free market uh, allows me to accept people who are different from me, okay? Because if I believe in the free market, I'm going to be a liberal person. I'm going to be a classic liberal. And that's what I hope you become you, my listener. And uh, I want you to be liberal uh, with mentioning me when you go buy your next car. I hope you consider Capital Toyota. Capital Toyota has uh, the, the car lot with the best vehicle you can buy. That's the Toyota. I have three going in my family. There's a special on the Camry. If you borrow for the car through the shop, you get a 0% APR rate of, of interest and uh, you get a thousand dollar rebate so do think about looking for your next car at capital toyota the mckamey family runs that these are these are good people they're they're, they're very conservative like like you and uh, they would love to have your business they would love to serve you okay they're here to serve you local economy players for you my local economy uh, entrepreneur and you are a consumer as well you're a shopper you are a uh, a buyer so uh, follow through on our idea if you think it's worth something and that is love your neighbor buy local uh, one man who says that is Josh Jennings he runs Hamilton Funeral Home a locally owned locally operated parlor a mortician's parlor if you will here in Hickson call Josh if you have uh, a death care need death care of course is how uh, in the professional world we call the uh, service to mourning families that's called death care service to the grief, whether it be embalming, cremation, a uh, place, uh, place you want to rent to, to gather a lot of folks together. Maybe your house is too small. You don't want to have the wake at your house having the body lying there on the dining room table, which is what used to be done all the time in Tennessee in the South. Rather, you rent your quarters at the funeral home. So try Hamilton Funeral Home, locally owned, 53139. Seven five. Of course, you can Google that that outfit as well. Five three one, three nine seven five. And if you're looking for advice on getting into your own little business, which I think is an essential part of your plan, as you as we face national disaster, national debacle, you might be wise to have another income stream and develop that now while there's time, while you have uh, while you have means, while you have uh, the occasion to think about it, and you're not overpressed, which you might be overpressed when the meltdown comes again. We had, we've had four tastes of meltdowns, and the last one was in 08. So that's going to happen again. These things are part of the natural declension of our capitalist, debt capitalist system. So call Bruce Krebs at Entrepreneur Source, 875-5621, 875-5621. He is your source for getting into the franchise field. Well, uh, about Casey, the thing I wanted to just, just to tell you where I want to go maybe a little bit later t today if I can remember to get back to it, that's the whole question of, of uh, the claims made by the lawyer in the suit against this 80-year-old businessman who, who revived the Chattanooga Choo Choo back in the 1980s. The idea is of multiple indebtedness, and that's the claim that he made. In fact, the headline in the Chattanooga Times Free Press today on page one is that, that he used the property uh, as a piggy bank, that somehow he multiply lent upon a, a, an asset which could not be multiply indebted. So that the whole idea, the, if he did these things, if Mr. Casey did these things, he is only doing what every bank does. Every bank violates a biblical prohibition against multiple indebtedness. And if you go back to the scriptures, and here's where the Christians have the explanation of our coming crisis. The Christians have it. The humanists <laughs> who can make money out of nothing, who can make ideas for your money, they don't. Well, the Christian theory is that, that you can't, and it comes in the, in the law regarding the cloak as collateral. The poor man's cloak is uh, his collateral. And uh, 
that that the, the prohibition that that the, that he has to that that cloak has to be given him it, it, it's a kind of a complex uh, concept but in the end he can't the poor man who has to borrow to survive he he can't collateralize his cloak more than one time and and uh, that that's a an overlooked passage in the the Christian Bible that you know you should ask your Christian friends about that ask ask them what that means ask them if they're uh, what the what the ask them if I'm right. Well, I was, uh, I was, I was just, uh, we were talking a minute ago about, about the, the, the prospect of reform, national reform, not, is, not, is not there. What, the, the, what happens to happen for reform can't be done nationally. It can only be done uh, by the quiet operations of the local marketplace. Uh, unostentatious, uh, not minding what happens on the national side, overlooking the offenses that come against the, the local market from the national side, such as uh, variations in the value of the monetary unit, the dollar. That's one big problem. And also uncertainty about taxation. And of course, Obamacare, which is the gigantic machine, the, the gigantic whirly gig that uh, is spinning around with multiple trains and whistles and little slider things and doors opening and little figures popping out. Uh, we're not sure what it's going to be doing. We do know that it is a, a boon to the insurance industry bailed out by a Democratic president, given a guaranteed market, a boon to the insurance giants of our, of our country. So, but w you, you, do real, you, you do realize that Democrats are for big business too, right? You, you do realize that. Okay, well, uh, the, the, a couple things I wanted just to, to throw, throw out here in, in the direction of, of uh, local economy that, that touch on the operation of the state the, the part of the state that has the gun on the holster. Well, there's a story on Channel 9, a television station here in Chattanooga, out of, out of Clarksville, about a student suspended over a knife in Dad's car. Now, I want you to just to think about these, these little snippets that, that I'm going to throw at you kind of in rapid order. The, the point of these snippets is for you to be a humble, submissive, obedient, compliant, and very cautious man not to cause offense do not cause offense and this in this story there's a there's an honor roll student he's facing serious charges tv9 says and may not graduate well you know maybe that's probably okay but during a random lockdown and search at northeast high school what is this random lockdown of, of local high schools for why do you not realize that the high school in this in this opera in this part of its operation is teaching people that they do not have rights that when they touch government anything touching government means that your rights are gone you do not have a right to privacy as the English say sheriff's deputies found an illegal weapon in David Duran Sanders car it was a fishing knife that belonged to his father David says he did not know the knife was in his car that was once his father's and says it must have fallen between the seats David's dad is a commercial fisherman of course, you might need a knife for that field. The policy on the matter matters seems to contradict itself. School policy for car uh, s car searches it says uh, that students are responsible for what's in their cars, but the policy on weapons possession says that there has to be mens rea. In other words, guilty mind. The student had to knowingly or intentionally bring the weapon on campus. So there's an appeal today. Apparently, there's an appeal hearing today in a factory school in Clarksville. Yeah, that's like Another story. Hold on a second, though. Can I jump in on this one? Uh, hold it. Russell, the tech guy, the kid, has a word for us. What I is have, it? I have a few words. I actually have a knife on me right now that I keep on my keys. Like, and I just have it with me all the time. I use it for opening boxes. I've, I've never, I haven't yet slashed anybody with it. But I would be suspended if I brought this into a school. I mean, think about that. I could, I could cause a school lockdown just by accidentally leaving my keys in my pocket. It is, is, when, I th when I hear of these sorts of things, I think of how brittle the system is. The, the whole system of government control, whether it's in, in the, the harmless field of education, right? You think that that would be uh, quite apart from the police uh, operation, but it's not. It's not at all. Uh, and that's because there have been school massacres with knives, have there not? Um, at least half of one that I can think of. <laughs> Yeah, I have one. Well, uh, I remember I've I've seen pictures of uh, students in the 1940s and 50s going to school with their rifles. Oh yeah, leaving their their rifles out by 
uh, out, out in the, in the, in, by the locker room, by the gym, so when they're done with school or during break, they can go out and shoot along the edge of the school property. Well, that and there were shooting classes in gyms. Well, we have been uh, we have been emasculated, and I think uh, that, that's why we have our man. Why are we the man station, Russell? What's the purpose for being the man station? Well, because we're men, are we not? And and uh, is there some way of increasing the the testosterone level of our of our list? Not that he doesn't have enough already, but could we not increase it for him just a little bit? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, uh, we carry guns all the time, don't we? <laughs> well, I, I won't say anything about that. <laughs> Anyway, that's my two cents. Thanks. Well, that, that's Russell, who runs our, our Generation Z, uh, pr the tech program. And uh, he's, uh, we call him the kid because he's uh, a homeschool graduate and uh, is very well informed about uh, matters tech and, and it has a, 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 an independent minded, uh, kind of libertarian oriented perspective, which I think the world of tech really requires you to have. If you, if you are a tech oriented, you have to understand that decentralization uh, is, is coming with a vengeance. It's coming with a vengeance and we really can't, you know, we, can, we can observe it, we can maybe applaud it. It is, it is coming. And the, 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 another story that I, that I, that just kind of, they all just kind of come at the same time. There's a story about no charges uh, for Michigan cops who fatally shoot homeless man. He's hit 11 times and there, there were several officers six of them in Saginaw surrounding uh, a, a man in his nearly 50 years old balding top a gray grayish hair on his on his under his nose and on his chin and uh, long General Burnside like uh, display of hair on in front of his ears he uh, was uh, shot at 47 times uh, but and the, the feds of course they, they think there might be a human rights violation a racial orientation oriented uh, rights violation well they determined that there was no not enough evidence to charge the six Saginaw police officers. Well, that's probably fine because it's a state matter anyway. What do the feds have to do with uh, something that takes place in state jurisdiction? Well, there's another story about uh, about 103 bullets fired uh, in a pickup truck containing two women. One of them, 47, uh, her mother. Uh, is, was in the in the pickup truck too. She was in her 70s, 71 year old, in Los Angeles during the Chris Dorner uh, hunt. This was the Chris Dorner, as you may remember, was the man who uh, had shot a police officer and uh, went on a rampage. And there were some officers protecting a man they thought might be a prospective target. So these men fired on a blue Toyota Tacoma pickup truck in which these two women were. 103 bullets uh, Maggie or Margie Carranza and the mother Emma Hernandez uh, cut by flying glass the mother according to the liberty the libertarian public.com was actually uh, hit by uh, by a bullet the, the these two were received a settlement from the, the LAPD for 4.2 million dollars and uh, in, in the same direction just by the way there's a story in the LA Times about the high court uh, expanding uh, searches without a warrant and, and, and it's this way. If there are two people in an apartment building or apartment dwelling and one, and they both, let's say they both come to the door when the police knock demanding uh, access for a search. If one says no, his no is overridden by the yes of his uh, colleague there in the t-shirt at his elbow. And, and so the, the affirmative allows for the search according to uh, the LA Times uh, narrative of a Supreme Court ruling yesterday in a case out of Los Angeles. So it's a 6-3 to three vote that uh, gives authorities more leeway to search. So if there's, if there's contradiction among the answers, uh, it, let's, say, let's say you've not talked with your wife about this. If your son, the teenager, uh, goes to the door too with your wife and uh, a search is demanded by, by a couple of deputies from Sheriff Hammond's force. The son says no, and the mom, your wife, says yes. Well, the yes controls, and according to this decision, the uh, the, ho the whole house is open, including your son's bedroom. Right? That maybe he's the one being sought uh, for some kind of uh, paper offense, and 
there has been uh, no warrant filed, but uh, search is, is requested. And, uh, and he, your mom, your, your wife's yes, opens your whole house, including your papers, you my listeners' papers, to the sheriff's uh, inquiry into your affairs. And, uh, and don't forget, a yes opens the whole house. That would include your your paper. Of course, without a warrant, they don't have to have. Th there's no limit on the search. If they if they say they want to come in and search the house and they don't have a warrant, which for it to be legal, the warrant has to enumerate and identify the things or people sought. If permission is granted by you for a search of, of your house, they can do anything they want. That because there's no limit by warrant, right? The warrant. It doesn't it, it's not it's not in play there's no limiting power of the judge's signature on the warrant so they can they can go through your papers they can look onto your computer they can look into your closet where you have your rifle where you have your 5000 rounds of ammunition maybe or your uh your special night scope right they're going to find out your night scope or the fact that you have a Barrett 50 caliber and that you have uh, some armor piercing, you know, whatever it is, they, they can find that, whatever. I'm sure you don't have those things, but you are a Copperhead listener, <laughs> my listener, and, uh, and uh, my name is David Toulis, and our show is NewGonomics.com. Well, about the farming situation, I'm running out of time, but the, the story in the, in the Wall Street Journal is, is about scientific advances in farming, and Monsanto has a a suite of uh, software applications called Field Scripts, and according to the the, the uh, WSJ.com essay, it's a, in the CIO Journal. It's supposed to help farmers get more out of their land. Uh, it takes account vagaries of sunlight and shade and variations in nitrogen and phosphorus content in the soil, precise to a 10 meter by 10 meter grid. Monsanto analyzes the data uh, in conjunction with the genetic properties of its seeds. Okay, got that? <laughs> and then it combines all this information uh, to make climate predictions. And then it makes, it sends back uh, instructions to the farmer. Uh, and of course, he's connected with an iPad uh, in his planting equipment in the field. And uh, Monsanto, according to this uh, Wall Street Journal story, says that field scripts uh, will improve yields by 5 to 10 bushels per acre. With corn at around $4 a bushel, that's an increase of 20 to $40 per acre. A small farm, say, of 500 acres could get, could get anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000 in extra revenue. But uh, Monsanto charges $10 per acre for the service, meaning the farm will pay about $5,000. In addition, the story says, to the tens of thousands of dollars it will pay to either retrofit existing planting equipment or buy more modern tractors that include the electronics gear that meshes with the scripts. Uh, but the problem seems to be that the more tech you have, the more centralization you have, and the cost, you know, the, the, the industrial farming cost is greater than anyone realizes. And, and of course, Nuconomics.com is about, we have done a lot of writing about the whole farm problem uh, and the need for local food, which is to say not necessarily scientifically raised crops, crops raised by individuals on a small scale. And there's a there's a an analyst quoted as saying that um, her name is her name is Olson that a, a small farm uh, might uh, would have to generate the maximum projected increase in yield just to break even. Small farms won't see the benefits of a pre of precision agriculture for the most part. But who does? Well, who does? The big factory farms, the gigantic players with their foreign, non-local owners. Those are the ones who prosper from the increase in technology. Why? Because they are rational systems at this point. They're not human. They don't have a human scale. And the lack of human scale is something that you have to fight against. You have to fight against it. And that's why local economy is, uh, is very much interested in this, uh, in this question of, of uh, favoring your local over your national provider. And that, that touches on everything from tax preparation to uh, where you get your car repaired. And speaking of tax preparation, uh, make note that, that if you have uh, tax needs, go to Eric Pelton. He runs EJ Pelton Accounting Company. Online, it's ejpelton.com. The number is 
6223156. That's 6223156. Eric is a CPA, longtime advisor, of, uh, doer of books, preparer of tax returns, has been doing this work for 37 years. He's kind of a local fixture, but he is someone you'll want to go to. N and avoid the national chains. Avoid the national chains. Pelton has a, a Saudi Daisy office that's quite busy, but make sure you get in early to have your your tax and accounting work done by Eric Pelton. And make sure that you let the, the person at the other end know that you are the Nuganomics.com listener, the Nuganomics.com fan. Uh, if you want to send me an email, I would really appreciate hearing from you, my listener. I know you've been busy, but why don't you take a, a minute or two out. Go to our website, Nuganomics.com. Drop me an email. Tell me if there's something you'd like to hear about. Send me some information. Send me a secret document. I'd like to see a secret document from you if you have one, okay? Uh, I, I'm involved in, I traffic in secret documents that are quasi-public, but uh, I do have an interest in some aspects of uh, documents little known by the general public, and uh, I, I write about those at nuganomics.com. My name is David Toulis. Our show is about local economy and the free market, and we have the, uh, the strange and tremendously weak idea from the slow man of Chattanooga, and that is that small is better than big, that near is better than far, and that personal is better than corporate. These three ideas are possible sources of salvation for Chattanooga, not spiritual salvation, but salvation in earthly terms. We face a disaster from deep government, from the deep state, if you will. It, it's not going to survive, and we have got to find a way to come out ahead. The name is David Toulis. The website, nuganomics.com. That's nuganomics.com. I've not heard from Sap today. Oh, well, I haven't called him. Really. He's probably meeting with his daughter's surgeon. He needs a computer, also. Oh, I have this. Yeah, that's that's Yeah. Is Here is not going to be bothered by it because I can't 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't function well when I have a conversation. Oh, I know. I don't get it. I can't do that. Yeah, Seb's so yeah, saying that he wants to soundproof this area here from about here at this corner out to here and then back to this wall. So this rectangular area from here yeah. to there to there will be soundproof. And hopefully you'll still have a window. Nice. Yeah. What's this uh, webcam companion? What's this uh, Arc Soft? I'm not sure. Just close it. Hi, David Tulis. Our show is NewGonomics.com. We cover local economy and the free market. We are not dispassionate, neutral, calm observers of the passing scene. We are, in fact, advocates for you. I am your advocate. I am the slow man of Chattanooga. And as the slow man of Chattanooga, it takes me a while to understand things. And since I'm so, I'm so late arriving uh, at understanding how the world works and and, and always unsure of the explanation, the official explanation that's offered to me, I, I think I can be of some use to you, my listener. And I do thank you for joining me, giving me just a couple of minutes of your day today. We're here every day from 1 to 3 at the Copperhead Station. We are a tiny, tiny little station, undercapitalized, but future-oriented, service-oriented. And we know that we shall prosper if we think about you, the listener. And and or you, the advertiser. Do think about uh, sponsoring our, our show, advertise to the other listener out there, right? There's you and then there's the other man, right? The other guy. <laughs> I have the feeling you and he might get along. I have the feeling that that other guy out there who likes nougacentrism might be your customer. You just have to think about, about how I, as the middleman in this arrangement, can connect with that other person. So we are about local economy. We favor personal economy. You can even call it personalistic. In other words, it's, it's a personal to the, to the point of, uh, of a philosophy, of, a, of, a, of a, a theoretical drive even. We are here to serve you, and uh, I want you to know about Ducks, the indoor air professionals who are able to serve you in another uh, manner, just as I uh, purify the air of uh, of intellect, the air of the th for the thinking man's thoughts to proceed and uh, breathe fresh the mountain 
air that, that wafts across the Smokies, uh, you should go to ducts, the indoor air professionals, to clean the air in your building, your house, or your, your business. If there's gradu or mold or grot, if you will, in your duct work, the Thompson family would love to, to serve you. They will get that, uh, get that crud out and make your, your business, empl your employees healthier. Call 876-9907. That's 876-9907. Zero seven and uh, Joan will uh, take your uh, take your order and have uh, the crew come out to look at your situation. That's uh, Ducks, the indoor air professionals, formerly known as Duck Busters. Well, we have a lot to get to, and uh, two hours is, is really never enough time for me. But there's a there's a great little story that I wanted to just draw from briefly from a website sustainable.org. It's about food economics. We, we've uh, written a lot about food the food crisis. Uh, not, we haven't said much about the obesity problem because that's, that's kind of just a, uh, th that is a, an evidence of an underlying problem. And, uh, and other people, of course, are talking about that a great deal. But we're trying to look at the, the economy angle of it and to, to look back beyond, beyond just consumption and overconsumption of this horrible, inedible food that is, uh, that is consumed by, uh, by you, perhaps, and certainly people you know or have ballooned out of all proportion. Well, there's a food economics crisis that, that has uh, invaded us, and it, 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 it is a parallel narrative to the rise of the nation state, the rise of uh, the welfare warfare state in many ways, toward uh, the, the, the rise of you might call American giantism, where, where rather than the scale of things being seen as too great, uh, the gigantic scale is seen as not great enough, you see, and, that, and so we have, we have all kinds of misdirections in our minds as to the general direction of things. Things need to be smaller, they need to be more personal, they need to be nearer rather than farther. And this essay talks about how a few corporations kind of run the food business. Uh, the largest of these agribusinesses this uh, text says are practically monopolies, controlling what consumers get to eat, what they pay for groceries, and what prices farmers receive for their crops and livestock. And of course, this is this is all the factory farm model arrives because of efficiency, and of course, efficiency becomes an ever greater interest the larger the operation, the more corporate oriented the operation becomes, the, the more remote the owner is. Right then, you have the manager uh, who's there, the the, the foreman. Uh, the steward, and uh, he has to always account to the, the remote owners who are uh, possibly other corporations and maybe not even individuals. And so, so a, a Pew Commission on Industrialized Farm Animal Production that came out in 2008 says that uh, there are unintended consequences of, of uh, the CAFO animal production model. It says, while increasing the speed of production, the intensive confinement production system creates a number of problems. These include contributing to the increase in the pool of antibiotic resistant bacteria because of the use of antibiotics, air quality problems, the contamination of rivers, streams, and coastal waters with concentrated animal waste, animal welfare problems, <coughs> mainly as a result of the extremely close quarters in which animals are housed, and, and significant shifts, the report says, in the social structure and economy of many farming regions throughout the country. Uh, it, this, this, uh, this essay cites a, a University of Minnesota studies, study that says that small farms with gross income of $100,000 or less made almost 95% of farm-related expenditures within local economies. But do you think large corporate farms do that? No, they buy their farming supplies, their, their seed and feed and, and the, the equipment, they buy them from the people who often are their, their customers from the large, uh, the large operations. The, the same study says that large farms with gross incomes greater than 900,000 make less than 20% of farm-related expenditures lo locally. So the orientation of a big farm is never local. And what we support, as does Benwood Foundation here in Chattanooga with its gaining ground uh, subsidiary, is local economy, local farming, the, the, the proximity of the source of the food and the table upon which or at which it is consumed. 
In other words, uh, also, this, uh, this essay points out that sustainable farming, as it likes to call it, requires <coughs> uh, more workers uh, and creates more jobs, while also doing a better job of feeding people on smaller plots of land than industrial farms. Despite decades of claims to the contrary, industrial farming has not relieved famine or hunger throughout the world. On the contrary, industrial agriculture has fed a culture of overconsumption, particularly in the United States where large quantities of food are, are tossed in the trash, while at the same time the population is in the throes of an obesity epidemic. There's another study cited that finds sustainable agriculture increases productivity by an average of 93 percent on 9 million farms in places such as the Sahel region in Africa, the hills of the Andes, the rainforests of Southeast Asia, and other places where synthetic chemical dependent farming is neither affordable or successful. And th this piece goes off the rails, I think, when it talks about subsidies. And it, it says that, that subsidies tend to go toward corporations. And, but, and it proposes a, a statist solution to a statist-oriented problem, and that would be price floors. That's, I don't think that's, that's a, a good idea. But it points out, this, this piece points out also that centralization, as a general concept, marks the ownership of seeds. And that there's a whole area that might be worth looking at sometime. Four, country, four companies control nearly a third of the global seed market, and two companies control 58% of corn seed. These are, these are problems that, that come about because of a, a shift away from local economy from the agrarian perspective that uh, Bob Cresswell in his, uh, in his little biography reveals. If you go to my, my website, nuganomics.com, you can find out a little bit more about Bob Cresswell and the past in Sevier County where he was born and how he's a, a local industrialist. So the, the story is fa from farm boy to industri local industrialist uh, as, as captured by a brief biography of him by a local writer named Jean Huddleston who does, she's hired to write these sort of uh, these, uh, brief narratives of uh, men and women who are generally older who whose children want to memorialize their lives and make note of accomplishments in a, in a, in a literate uh, and colorful way. The story about Alan Casey is worth looking at. There, there are two long reports, one in timesfreepress.com and the other at chattanooga.com, which re reproduces a, a filing. And uh, in, that, in, that, in that filing, Gary Patrick, a lawyer, says that Mr. Casey defrauded these people. He acted like this property was his personal piggy bank. He literally treated this as his own back pocket. And nobody knows where the money went. Of course, that's, if it's your property, that's fine that you're doing that. But the point that he's making is that there were multiple uh, mortgages on the same piece of land. And if that, and I, and I want to talk just a, a, a moment about that whole idea. That, that of course, has to be established that there's a, as the Casey Empire seems to be collapsing, there's uh, a lot of confusion. And I think the confusion is expressed in both stories as, as they try to explain all the various parts of his uh, assets. There's a, there's a chancery suit that filed that was, that's fun starting today over uh, business deals that Mr. Casey is involved in. And the bankruptcy filing was in federal jurisdiction yesterday. The, the John Wilson story says that, that two attorneys, David Moss, are <laughs> David Moss is, one, is owed $113,000 in fees, and another attorney, Jim Henry, is owed a million dollars for representing him over a decade. I'm not sure how Jim Henry uh, can let uh, a bill go that long without receiving payment. But uh, it's, a, it's a big controversy. And the, the idea, uh, I think what you can take out from, from this, this story is the idea of, of banking. And we have to understand that what, if, if, what these, if, if these accusations against Alan Casey are true, What's happened is that you've had, you have multiple indebtedness on the same piece of collateral. And that, that is viewed uh, with indignity because people think they have the mortgage, the first mortgage on a piece of land. Well, they don't. They, they have maybe a fifth mortgage or a, an eighth mortgage. 
I'm not, I don't know what the story is in the details, but it, that's the idea that's been presented by the accusers. Well, assume for a moment that that idea is true or, or not, but the idea still is of interest because the concept of multiple indebtedness is what underlies and, shall we say, undermines the banking system in Chattanooga, in Hamblin County, across the entire country. Whether you are dealing with a bank, a savings and loan association, or a credit union, they all have the same, the same function, they have the same premise. And, and to me, this is not, you say, well, that, well who cares about that? You know, we, we, just, we just go to the bank to put our paycheck in, we have direct deposit, and uh, yeah, I took a loan out for $5,000 for uh, a half payment on a, on a used pickup truck. Okay, well, that's what I use banks for, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong about that. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're right. But you have to understand why we have a national crisis. We have a national crisis because uh, of this very problem of multiple indebtedness, having multiple mortgages on the same piece of property with all the holders of the paper thinking that somehow they are the owner and that that asset belongs to them. Uh, if they need to, to uh, liqui liquidate or liquefy themselves, they can uh, attach themselves to that piece of land. Well, there's a problem there if, if all these creditors of, of Alan Casey are thinking that this, this uh, barge on the riverfront or other assets that Mr. Casey has, has if, if they all somehow think that they're all the first mortgage holders, then you've got a problem. You have, there's a, there's a problem that the court, the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, has to sort out. Who's first, right? Who, who is the first holder of the note? And that's, a, I guess, a study of chronology of uh, notary signatures, date stamps, and, and things like that. But the idea, Christianity has the idea that, that, that these kinds of things should not happen. Christianity has the explanation of our national crisis. And I think that if you don't have a, a moral perspective on economics, if you don't view economics as a moral issue and not just a technical statistical issue, you will have a hard time in understanding our situation. And that's why, that's why I'm here with you every day to, to talk about some of these things, a little bit every day here and there. Uh, as the headlines suggest the direction of our conversation, well, I hope to be useful. Okay, so what? So I, my, my, my argument is that Alan Casey, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting this is, is an argument about him, but maybe he's not guilty because he is just doing what the whole national economy does with multiple indebtedness. Well, the scriptures, here's, if you want to start with the solution to this or the, the way of understanding the problem, you have to go to the, the, you have to go to Christianity. Christianity in its Older Testament, in the, in the, first, uh, in the first Covenant, has various provisions which are, uh, are economic in nature. And there's one, there's one, uh, there's one statute in, Is in, old, in the Old Republic in the, in, the, in the Israelite Republic. The Confederacy, it was a Confederacy at first and then it became a kingdom with the arrival of Saul, the first king, uh, who, who was a king from, um, he was a king that un unified and sort of oppressed and suppressed the distinctions of the, of the 12 tribes, the 12 states, if you will, the 12 colonies, perhaps. Well, the law was that, that a uh, if a poor, who borrowed? Only poor people needed to borrow. Who borrowed? The desperate. If you borrowed, you had to have collateral. A poor man doesn't have a lot of collateral, so he might have one thing that he has on his person, and that is his cloak. And so the, the lender, as he takes collateral, that is to say the cloak, he has to give it back at the end of the day. And then at the beginning of the day, when the night is over and the sun has come out and warmed up the stones and the path and the, the fields are glimmering once again with some warmth, the borrower has to give the collateral back to the, the lender. Now this, this, create, this is a very awkward situation, right? It, it seems untenable. It seems very impractical. And in a way it is. It, it, it makes borrowing very difficult. That's, uh, that's an important point. It makes borrowing local. In other words, the borrower will go to someone he knows who can lend him the money. And it's, it's someone who, who is very close to 
the lender in time and space, someone who's in his neighborhood. So what you have is, is you have a requirement for local economy in lending. The loan has to be uh, collateralized and the collateral has to be given back to the poor man who has to be, has to have his cover at night and that's what the cloak is for. And so, so, so there are two, there are two points. This, uh, this is brought out in a, in a great book, uh, Tools of Dominion. It's about the case laws of Exodus. So it's a, it's a detailed legal study that I have uh, in my library that I've, I've read quite a few chapters from and find it very helpful. And it's by Gary North, the, the Christian economist. And the, the, the idea is that, um, he said, this is a strange form of collateral since the lender cannot use it when it is most needed. Its purpose is twofold. First, to restrict loans of charity to local regions whenever possible. Lenders are supposed to be in close contact with borrowers. Okay, that's local economy. And the second is to reduce multiple indebtedness. He explains that while the lender cannot use the cloak during the night, the debtor cannot use it during the day. <laughs> okay, he can't go shopping his debt. He can't go to other wealthier men than he and extend his cloak as collateral, right, because it's already seized by the first one. Uh, he cannot use a cloak during the night. He cannot use the same cloak as collateral for several loans at the same time. He is limited in his ability to indebt himself and the future. And a lender is not required to take any form of collateral. This indicates that a major form of collateral for a loan is the lender's perception of the borrower's character and his ability to repay the loan. Character, in fact, North says, is a better form of collateral since the lender does not have to go to the trouble of returning the cloak each evening. This reduces transaction costs. The less trustworthy the borrower's character, the more likely that the lender would require the cloak, fearing multiple indebtedness. And so there's a, there's a lengthy discussion. This book is uh, past uh, 12, uh, 1,200 pages. There's a lengthy discussion about this after that paragraph that I read you. And it's in the direction of, uh, of our banking system today. And in a nutshell, banking works in a multiple indebtedness fashion. You are the depositor, put on time deposit, say a CD, $1,000, or let's say, let's say $100. Well, that $100 is lent out, but because the, the reserve system is fractional, the bank doesn't lend out just your $100 that you're agreeing to leave, it, leave there for, say, six months. It, it makes $1,000 or $900 upon uh, pivoting, uh, pirouetting, if you will, upon your, your 900 uh, smackers that are uh, digitally kept in, in the record book of that bank. And what happens is your, uh, so, so your, your loan is used multiple, multiple times. The bank, of course, is the debtor. You, the depositor, you're the lender, okay? I know you didn't, never thought of it that way, but when you deposit money on a bank, especially in a time arrangement, you are the lender and the bank is the debtor. But the bank uh, multi lends out your money multiple times. It lends out your money nine times in the case of the example I gave you. If, it, if there's $900, if there are $900 created in fractional credit on your $100 deposit, then your $100 has been lent nine times. The problem there are many problems that come with this. One of them is the inherent inflationary nature of the modern banking system, which violates this biblical commandment, this, this biblical idea that, that only desperate people borrow. And when they do borrow, their collateral can be used just one time. Their deposit, in other words, can be used just one time. And because we have, uh, we have this, this pirouetting of, of credit based on minimal deposits, and, and the the, the, it used to be 10 percent, but I think in some in some smaller banks the the reserve requirement can be under one percent. So a, a bank can have one dollar on deposit and lend a thousand dollars based upon that. I've not I've not checked into that lately, but that's what I'm remembering from earlier reading into this into this question. And we have we have a whole system of, of economics that have, has grown up based on credit, and credit is a an inexplicable helix. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that is uh, mind-boggling. No one can really understand it. But the underlying principle is there, and that is that uh, there, is, uh, there is a multiple claim upon all deposits. Okay? That means that you, 
if you have a deposit, say, at, a credit, at the credit union or at, at SunTrust or Regions or any other, other bank, you have, uh, you have uh, a deposit with an institution which has multiply lent it out. But what if you and everybody else want their deposit at the same time? What if there is a national crisis, a, a moment of fear, a loss of confidence in the economy? Well, these banks, uh, because they are, they're technically not solvent, they have to have insurance. And so they go to FDIC. FDIC, F-D-I-C, is the insurer for banks. There's, there are others for credit unions and savings associations. And wh what they do is they make it possible for these banks to not go under. That they are not solvent because they are multiply indebted. If, and, and the problem is that these banks create whole portfolios based on very shallow pools of deposited assets. And so while they are legally solvent, they're in the sense of they're, they're, not, they're not getting letters from, uh, from FDIC on Friday afternoon, uh, you know, the, the bank inspectors are not washing into the lobby Friday afternoon and uh, with uh, tape dispensers to tape notes on the door about how the bank is being seized. Uh, they're, they're, that's not, they don't face that, but they are not sound in their function. As a class, as a class of businesses, the only business in the country that can make money from nothing are those that are most likely to need taxpayer bailouts. And they are, they are premised on confidence. They stand on the confidence of the hardworking public, like you and me, David Toulis, the slow man of Chattanooga. I thank you for joining me here at Nuganomics.com. We've got a lot more to talk about. Thank you for joining me. Nuganomics.com.
or call them now. We'll have it ready when you get there. 757-1616. That's 757-1616. Hot and delightful above the clouds. Jet's Pizza. Mmm, now that's Italian. Hello, guess what? Haven't you heard about the new flight museum in Hickson? The Hickson Flight Museum is one of the most unique places you'll ever visit. We believe in not only preserving history, but giving it life. Our exhibits are living, breathing historical artifacts that are regularly maintained and operated. Hickson Flight Museum, offering guided tours, okay, working so parks, what else do I have? Um, event rentals, and air shows. Located in the Dallas-based Sky Park, 1824 East Crabtree Road in Hickson. 423-228-2359, the Hickson Flight Museum. Its curators encourage visitors to climb into the pilot seat of the North American T-28 Trojan, peer into the cockpit of a 1946 Taylor craft, and enjoy a scenic trip over Chattanooga in a 1958 Piper Apache. We're open for individual or group tours, and we welcome school groups, boys and girl scout troops, or any group interested in learning about aviation history. And what we do, please visit our website at hicksonflightmuseum.org. 423-228-2359. Check us out on Facebook. The Copperhead 1240 Southern Rock. Kick in country. Tennessee Talk. Copperhead 1240. Get the latest news and information now. On your Twitter account, search Hot News Radio. That's Hot News Radio. For the latest news and information, go to Hot News Radio. That's Twitter.com. Then search Hot News Radio. Hot News Radio is a service of Copperhead 1240. Live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, it's Nuganomics with David Twitter. Hi, David Toulis. I guess you heard that the Hamilton County Commission overturned its vote from last week to let Sheriff Jim Hammond buy automated speeding cameras. And a group of uh, elected officials yielding to fierce and noisome public pressure as Americans are increasingly fed up with surveillance and, and the the humiliation that comes with being an American today. Being an American means that you are subservient, you are docile, you are goaded left and right. And no one really seems to know what their rights are or what his rights are. And it's, uh, it's kind of mystifying that we are in this situation. A, a militant people, Americans are so, uh, they are kind of a bloodthirsty people. They're warmongering, they fully <laughs> applaud their national government as, uh, as having forces in 150 countries and engaging in military operations left and right, some of which are reported in the press. And we take it all in stride as, well, that's just what we, you know, we're, we're the world leaders, we are the good people of America, and we have a responsibility to the world to uh, send troops and uh, assert power and to choose between Tyrant A and Tyrant B, both of whom are Muslim, right? They're both Muslims, and we will we will favor one over the other, and uh, find there's an American interest in there. That we just we don't have to tell you. We, we, you don't need to know because we are the smart people, and you just have to just have to comply with our our wisdom, our knowledge, our our high level of intelligence. We have the the leading intelligence service in the world, the national security agency. Well, I was reading just, just by the way, a, an essay yesterday, uh, critical of, of Common Core, and, and it's interesting how, how the critics of Common Core are, uh, they are right about, <coughs> sorry, they're right about a lot of things regarding, regarding its uh, centralizing effects and its, uh, its humiliation of the teacher and its uh, rejection of literature. And there, there are other things that are that are important about it that are maybe not not in view. But the, the 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 thought that comes to me sometimes when I read these very intelligent critics, such as Stan Karp, who is a New Jersey English teacher and journalism teacher, who writes on a website called RethinkingSchools.org, which Bobby Patre in Nashville, the Eagle Forum lady, the notable conservative and and uh, defender of the free market in in Nashville passed along earlier this week. I read the whole, the whole piece that she reproduces parts of in her, in her email, in her missive by, 
by email. And there is, the, the problem is that while there's wariness of, of certain aspects of Common Core, there is an acceptance that, that the state has a business in education. And let me put my glasses on here. For example, uh, Stanley Carp says, they have become part of a larger political project, that is to say, the standards, to remake public education in ways that go well beyond slogans and making sure every student graduates from college career ready, however that may be defined. Uh, he, uh, there, there, there's, there's an assumption that, on the whole, this is a good, a good thing. And we, we don't want to question the main premise. We, we can complain all we want about how No Child Left Behind from President Bush re just strewn records, wreckage everywhere. There are all kinds of waivers that are now having to be granted to states who are collapsing under the demands, the administrative demands for performance in public school systems. And uh, CARP points out that, that uh, Bill Gates gave $160 million to uh, push parts of Common Core. Edu there's an, he cites an Education Week blogger and science teacher Anthony Cody, who found that many of the people who are writing these uh, these documents are connected with testing organizations, the college test, the college board, and Achieve Zero, and others who have a, a financial stake in in this whole system because they they are about the the mechanizing of, of humanity. There's a call, there's a teacher called Nancy Carlson Page, and she's quoted as saying, "In all." There were 135 people on the review panel for the Common Core. Not a single one of them was a K to three classroom teacher or early childhood professional. Well, okay, uh, parents were entirely missing. Uh, this uh, this writer says K-12 educators were mostly brought in after the fact to tweak and endorse the standards and lend legitimacy to the results. People who have high hopes for reforming public education are making a mistake that's warned about. In the, in the Christian scriptures, and that's putting new wine in old skins. And of course, the problem with doing that is that new wine tends to expand. And if you, if you have an old skin that's not supple, it'll just break in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the aging process. It'll break through the skin, and you lose your wine. There cannot be reform of legacy systems. And our, our, uh, probably because the legacy systems are financially bankrupt. They are uh, they are inefficient. They're, they have gigantic costs, which no one can really evaluate. You, you do know that it costs you, the taxpayer, uh, about $10,000 per year to keep a child in the Hamlin County schools. Well, it, the price should be maybe six or $700 if it were a free market operation. So you have a, a 10 times, a, a, a thousand percent overpricing of the service because there's not transparency which is something you have only in a free market. If you have a bureaucratic marketplace, even one that has competing bureaucracies, right? A, a, a tax-funded school, a charter school, competing against the non-charter school, tax-funded school, that's competition, all right, but it's not really bringing the oxygen that the marketplace needs. Local economy is all about that very oxygen, which is missing whenever you have uh, the power of the gun, the power of the tax, the fist in the velvet glove operating the marketplace. And think in, think in terms, we've been talking about Alan Casey's bankruptcy filing and his whole empire and the accusation made by a lawyer filing, who's filed a lawsuit against him of, of multiple indebtedness, of using the same piece of property as his piggy bank. Well, in a way, that's to use your property as your piggy bank is, is totally harmless. But the point that this lawyer is making it, that, that will be established in, in court <coughs> is that there were multiple mortgages on the same piece of property without, uh, without one party knowing that the other had a prior claim upon it. Well, what, what, do, what do banks do? I, I, I read a fair amount of general literature about banking. I've been uh, enjoying Garrett Garrett's uh, book the bubble that broke uh, the bubble that broke the world about the the crash uh, in the the Hoover administration in the in the American economy the credit economy that uh, endured an inflation and then it popped the Dow was at 200 and uh, when it popped it was it was because of 
uh, an involvement of a state mechanism, a state actor in the field of credit. And these are things that are important, you have to remember, because you here in local economy, you my listener, the dad, the family man, right, the man who believes in marriage, who believes that capital comes from marriage, uh, you are, you're going to have to account for these things that, that we bring up here. And that's why I don't, I'm not bound simply to, to reading the business news from Dave Flesner's pen, right, the business editor of the Time Free Press. Our show is not just about giving business news. It's really beyond that. It's about the idea of the marketplace and how when you don't have a free market, you have, you have people who are favorites. They are the ones who profit. And the, what, what, if you don't have a free market, you have always special people who prosper. And of course, the Democrats say that that's, that's big business. Well, that's true. And of course, the Republicans, they say that government is the one that, that's prospering. Well, that, that's true also. But in a way, both parties are, are at fault for the, the situation that we have, this irredeemable and unfixable situation. Uh, Charles Hugh Smith is a writer who, who makes great points about the banking sector, as does Garrett Garrett and uh, Dr. North, Gary North, the, the economist who is uh, an amazing and prolific writer. Smith says, the pull of habit and propaganda is so strong that most people haven't even recognized that software and the web can replace the entire financial banking sector for a fraction of the cost of the current parasitic system. A system, he says, that has captured the regulatory and governance machinery of the central state, making a, mock a mockery of democracy. So what do, what do banks do? Well, they hold depositors' money. They're a clearinghouse for payments, transfer of, of funds from payor to payee. They issue loans on a fractional reserve basis with a, a few bucks, of course, as the basis of uh, a balloon of, of credit denominated in dollars. There are no dollars connected. They're just pretend dollars. They're idea sphere dollars. And the fourth thing that banks do is, is that they originate he says, and trade derivatives. They run high-speed trading desks, operate various money laundering and embezzlement schemes, influence elected officials with lobbying and campaign contributions, and subvert both free market capitalism and democracy at every turn. As Thomas Jefferson warned, as Alexander Hamilton, the intellectual marvel of the founding of the republic, worked so hard to uh, nationalize debt and to create a national bank. Well, if, you're, if you've traveled, you've been in Europe, and you know how in, 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 say, Switzerland, you can go to the post office and get money, right? The post office is a bank. And, and uh, Smith suggests that there are all kinds of ways that the banking sector uh, is flowing outward. And it could be that even the moribund monopoly for first-class mail, the, the U.S. Postal Service devised by Ben Franklin, could be a, a salvation for local economy and an end to a, a corrupt system of business, the licensing of the fractional reserve process, which, which remember, you can't do that. You mm -hmm. can't make money from nothing. You have to work for every dollar that comes to you, but the, because, but the banking sector that includes savings associations and credit unions, they create hot money. Again, money that wasn't existing a moment before, that is created in the lending process based on the fractional reserve of dollars deposited by, by people like you and me. He says this entire parasitic middleman sector could be replaced with automated digital clearinghouses and crowdfunded or non-bank loans. Why do we need banks to pay bills online? Well, we don't. Any clearinghouse could charge a small fee for the transactions. Why do we need banks when loans can go crowd, can be crowdfunded? Why, if we can invest money in startups via Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Rocket Hub, Angel List, why can't we own a piece of someone's auto loan or home mortgage? You see what's happening here? You have a trend toward decentralization thanks to the web, the intergalactic web, the anti in a way the web is anti-local, right? It's placeless, it's geographyless. It is the part of the all-seeing eye above all places, above all time.
almost. The web and software now enable the elimination of the entire middleman skimming operation, says Smith on, on his website of twominds.com. Those with capital can invest that capital directly in loans that the investors choose. Risk is distributed throughout the entire system, and the process of varying, verifying credit scores, income, valuations, and so on, the building blocks of risk assessment, and a market for debt and cash can also be automated. He says, many other advanced nations have long combined postal and simple banking services. France and Japan come to mind. Here we have a postal service that is struggling in, in the U.S. to fund its operations in the era of email. And here we have millions of people who prefer to or have to do simple banking in person. There is no technical or administrative reason that the post office could not operate as it does in Japan as a place to deposit funds, including auto deposit of social security checks, to take out cash, and so on. Apparently there's been, been a report on NPR about this point. He says, please note that I'm, what I'm suggesting is a transparent open market for these services provided by a range of enterprises and institutions. And also think that when the post office becomes your bank, it doesn't create new money. It doesn't create money from nothing, which is inflationary and which reduces the buying power of you, my listener, here in local economy in Chattanooga. He says, as for business loans, you can get small business loans on PayPal right now. It's called working capital. And the borrower is given the total amount due right up front. As for commercial paper, there's no technical reason why a transparent exchange couldn't enable borrowers and owners of capital to set short-term loan rates via transparent bidding with automated software. There was a, a video the other day Alex Jones at, I think, uh, a branch of the, the Fed in Texas, and he's the, the loudmouth conspiracy r journalist and, and publisher. And the whole question was, uh, so the Fed is private, right? And, and the, the security man was trying to shoo him and his camera crew off the, off the property, and, and he kept saying, this is private property. And that's true. The Fed is private property. It is a cartel. It is a monopoly owned by banks and others, others who are the owners of a, of a system. That has authority under the legal tender statute to issue money and to have lenders paid back in that same in that same dollar, meaning that the the legal tender laws force lenders who are people of capital, right, people of means, institutions of means, to lend out this this uh, idea sphere of money and to be paid back in the same unit, though that same unit is cheaper, less than it buys less than it did at the time when the loan was extended. Smith has another another essay on the deep state that, that uh, raises a great question. Of course, the deep state is the idea of the state behind the state. Uh, and of course, you have the state is, of course, something that's separate from government, right? Government is the representative that you elect. It is, it is the outward shape of government, the face of, of government. The state is the eternal, seemingly eternal, impersonal, being behind the government. So there is a difference between the United States as the state and the government of the United States. The state is, in, in Turkey, it's called the deep state. And I think the, that usage, which is, I'm sure you've already heard in, in the popular press, got its uh, start in Turkey, where there is, of course, a conflict among the various actors. And Smith has a, a great little graphic he published uh, several years ago a bunch of circles that, that have in the very middle the executive branch, the Pentagon, the Congress, and the, and the judiciary. And around this circle in a phalanx are uh, a couple dozen other circles uh, grouped by, you know, you've got the corporations and media on the upper left, and on the right you have DARPA, Silicon Valley, the black budget, and so on. And bottom left you have retail banking, mortgages, hedge funds, and the tax evasion complex, and so on. He says the deep state is not just the trilateral commission. It's not just these, uh, you know, the Institute for Strategic St and International Studies. These are, these are just instruments that serve the deep state. 
And they are people who, and organizations that, that are elites that maintain and extend global dominance. And how does that affect you? How does that affect local economy? Well, it does in the sense that I, I think it's wise to know about this idea of the deep state. But also, don't be too anxious about it. Have a sense of resignation <laughs> that it exists. Because it is, whatever it's going to do, uh, it, it, it's going to do regardless of you. It doesn't care a whit about you. Right? You're a common American. There are 300 million or so of us here. There are a couple thousand people who sort of own the system, who are the, the unnamed parties behind government. And some of this is not be conspiratorial, but much of it's been published. Uh, the coverage from the 50s, well, maybe from the 20s through the 50s, is from Carol Quigley in his book, which Macmillan broke the plates for. It's called The Tragedy and the Hope. And th this work is, is covered by other very important writers. I would mention John Taylor Gatto, who's a broken down old New York school teacher, who has spent a lot of time in the New York Public Library. But the deep state has, it does exist, and it's important to understand that while we may no, not know its operation, it does have an interest in stability. And even though it would look like the Fed is, is about to destroy itself, requiring a hyperinflation, well, Smith says that the deep state has an interest in stability, and because it does, it's very possible that, that we might, we're going to have what, what, what the common press would call a deflation, but which is a st stabilization of the dollar's buying power. And in he says, in fact, that the deep state has an interest in the dollar buying war. Well, again, that means deflation, that there is a, an interest in the dollars that these, uh, these very wealthy and important people have buying more in the future, not less. But the, the common analysis that I've been giving is that we face a hyperinflation, that we face a, an inflation of some kind, uh, which again affects you and me, the retail man, because our buying power is less. We, we would need to be buying silver and gold. We would need to be buying Glocks, land, maybe uh, depressed property uh, on, in tax sales and things like that. There's a quote here from a writer named Mike Lofgren who has an essay called Anatomy of the Deep State. He says, there is another more shadowy, more indefinable government that is not explained in Civics 101 or observable to tourists at the White House or the Capitol. The subsurface part of the iceberg I shall call the Deep State, which operates according to its own compass, heading regardless of who is formally in power. The term Deep State was coined in Turkey and is said to be a system composed of high-level elements within the intelligence services, military, security, judiciary, and organized crime. I use the term to mean a hybrid association of elements of government and parts of top-level finance and industry that is effectively able to govern the United States without reference to the consent of the governed as expressed through the formal political process. People who, who understand how these, the, these things are, or who at least suspect they understand, are, are going to be much less likely to be concerned about local political developments on the national scale. Now certainly, locally, there has to be an interest in, in unseating the unfit, the people who are unfit to serve the public. That would be Chris Anderson. Uh, that would probably be Jerry Mitchell and maybe others on the city council. But uh, they, they are unfit to govern. They are unfit to represent you, my listener, and the man in the next cubicle to you or at the next station there in your factory. They're not, they're not fit to represent you. But on the national side, uh, these, these, these contests are much less significant. And you have to understand that, that I'm not saying they're not important, but they're not significant in, in changing anything. It, there can't be fundamental change by politics. And, and that idea seems even more powerful when you consider this idea of, of what the Turks call the deep state, because we have one here too. And uh, you know, th is there a connection with Freemasonry? Well, maybe. Is there a connection with the superior general of the Jesuits, the, the order of Ignatius Loyola? Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, but those things aside, what, what I think we have to recognize is that that we have to be busy about local economy. We have to be busy about thinking of the other, thinking about 
the customer that you have. And, and starting your own little business, you need to start somehow using what you know, the genius that you have, to have a little tiny enterprise based on something that you know, based on a gift that you have, using your own capital. You need to get that capital that you've got, those, those dollars, that are on Wall Street, in the mutual fund, over at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Bring them back to Chattanooga. Invest locally. Get liquid, guy. Get liquid, because a bad time is ahead. And we need to have as much prosperity in Chattanooga as we can. We need to become richer, better, more populated. And you can help in every one of those things. You, my listener, thank you for joining me. My name is David Toulis. Our show is Nuganomics.com. Go to Nuganomics.com, my little website. David Toulis.